so the next session, which we're going to start our afternoon with, is how are others preparing for the future? And um, the moderator of this panel is Colonel Liam Collins, who's had a very distinguished career in Joint Special Operations Command um, and uh, is instrumental in setting up the West Point's Counterterrorism Center and also the Modern Warfare Institute. Uh, he's also a fellow at New America. I'm going to hand it over to Liam. All right, for this panel, I'll be joined by Brigadier General U.S. Army Retired Brian Davis, who's the Director of China Research Division at Blue, pa Blue Path Labs and former Defense Attaché to uh, Beijing, China. Uh, Dr. Andrea Kendall-Taylor, Senior Fellow and Director of Transatlantic Security Program at the Center for New America uh, Security and former Deputy National Intelligence Officer for Russia and Eurasia at the National Intelligence Council. And Dr. Tricia Bacon, Associate Professor at American University and author of uh, Terror and Transition. So we had about 30 minutes for this panel, so we'll try to work through it and cover these three important uh, topics during that time, uh, which will be a challenge. Uh, but I, will not, I promise I will not monopolize the full 30 minutes, so audience, be, uh, please have uh, some questions in mind, so we'll have some time at the end for that. Uh, the most recent national security strategy states, the most pressing strategic challenge facing our vision is from powers that, lay, uh, that layer authoritarian governance with a revisionist foreign policy. Russia and the People's Republic of China pose different challenges. Russia poses an immediate threat to the free and open international system, recklessly flouting the basic laws of the international order today, as its brutal way, war of aggression against Ukraine has shown. The People's Republic of China, by contrast, is the only competitor with both the intent to reshape the international order and increasingly the economic, diplomatic, military, and technological power to advance that objective. So, so it is important to understand the intentions and capabilities uh, of these two nations. Uh, so General Davis, I'll start with you first and ask you, how is China preparing for the future? Thanks, Liam, and uh, thanks to New America and Arizona State for the opportunity to participate in this forum. So before I address your question, I guess I would ask the question, so what is China preparing for? And I would offer that China is preparing to regain its position as a, a major global power, uh, but not just necessarily a major global power, but potentially the major global power by the middle of this century. Uh, and they do this in several sectors. So politically, <clears throat> if you look at what Xi Jinping has done since he's uh, taken over as General Secretary of the Chinese Communist Party, uh, he's strengthened his control of the party, uh, and then he strengthened the party's control of both the state and the military. He's centralized decision-making around himself, leading both established uh, formal committees in charge of all, all of the major key issues that he's interested in, but also ad hoc committees. Uh, and finally, he has um, driven the system from what was primarily a consensus-based decision-making system after the chaos of Mao Zedong uh, back to where he is at the center of that decision-making structure. Why, is he do, why does he do that? Well, he, it appears that he thinks he's the only person that can lead China to its rightful place in the future, which is the rejuvenation of the great Chinese nation. Uh, economically, uh, for example, China is finding ways to maintain connectivity across global economies with major economies of the world, but also ensure that several of those economies are reliant on China. Uh, and they're taking efforts to improve technologic, te technology innovation, modernization, and independence. Uh, for example, uh, this year in the spring in the National People's Congress, uh, a law was passed to both reform and reorganize the Ministry of Science and Technology, which uh, will oversee strategic technologies, policies, investments, funding, et cetera. And they're also taking efforts to strengthen their uh, supply chains and domestic production, and, and specifically some of the key areas for domestic production, production are 35 technology, what they call choke points that are critical for China's economic development. Uh, finally, they're also strengthening their domestic sector of their economy to help better insulate China from foreign, um, foreign influence, uh, negative foreign influence, be it sanctions or just the ups and downs of the global economy. Economically, Ch uh, I'm sorry, diplomatically, China's working to reshape the international institutions that it's a member of, but also at the same time establishing parallel institutions. It's also courting the global south. 
you see that play out in the United Nations, but, but elsewhere as well. Militarily, we, we do tend to, I follow that more than the others, but obviously the PLA continues to modernize rapidly. Uh, with the goal, as stated by Xi Jinping, of achieving basic modernization by 2035 and become a world-class military by the middle of the century. And then finally, in the information realm, China continues to strengthen its influence across global media, uh, its propaganda system, both uh, directed at its uh, domestic population and internationally, and is strengthening its influence operations across the world, led by the party's United Front Work Department. These are just a few examples of how China is preparing for the future. So what has China learned, if anything, from the Russia's invasion of Ukraine in terms of impacting their goals, vision, strategy? Has anything changed based off of what's, how that's played out over the last 20 months? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's still playing out. So they still have the, the ultimate lessons, lesson or lessons that they take are not necessarily fully established. But I think a couple examples are if you look at the run-up to Russia's invasion in February of last year, it's how the United States and its allies leveraged intelligence and got it out into the public sector. So how, how is China going to prepare for that and insulate? That, that's probably a major lesson that they took prior to and right after the invasion. I think another area that they would see is you know, information aspect in general, controlling the narrative, shaping that narrative for multiple audiences. Uh, Russia has not necessarily done that as well as uh, what China would be prepared to do. Looking at the will of the Ukrainian people to fight against uh, Russia, I mean, I think most of us were surprised at what they've been able to do. Uh, that obviously is a key factor for what could play out if there were to be some sort of a Taiwan military scenario, whether it's the will to fight or at least the will as a, as a, as a population to hold out until potential help could come from the United States. And one thing that we're learning, I mean, you shouldn't say we're learning, some of us are learning, some of us already know it, but you know, technology matters, but the people are probably more important than technology as we're learning in the war, once again. And I wonder if you can build a professional non-commissioned officer corps or, or empower junior leaders in an authoritarian state where that is a kind of a risk to the nation. You know, is that something, what is China doing to ensure that they have, or do they have, you know, junior officers that are able of taking initiative on the battlefield with the speed of warfare in the 20th, 21st century? So, yeah, the Chinese military, it's a, it's a different system than what we think of when we think of Western militaries. Um, part of it is the Leninist control over the army, and so it's different. There's the influence of Chinese culture on the army. There's the influence of the Chinese Communist Party's influence and culture. But in general, um, it is a much more centralized decision-making system. The party and the PLA senior leadership values that. They do understand that they need more junior officers and NCOs to be able to take initiative, but it's more constrained than what you might think of from your military background or my military background. Uh, and, and NCOs tend to be more, not necessarily technicians, but more uh, able to execute tasks than be that key small unit leader that develops, that has grown in our military, that, that's the strength of what our military is. But it continues to involve, evolve, they continue to uh, change their personnel policies and their training to make their NCO core better. But I wouldn't say it's going to be an NCO core that is a mirror image of a Western NCO. Thanks, Brian. Uh, I'll, I'll now turn to you, Dr. Kendall Taylor, and ask you a similar question. What, what's Russia doing to prepare for the future? Yeah, I'll start with your point about the national security strategy, talking about Russia as immediate threat. And I think that's right, but we have to also understand that it's a persistent threat. And so what do I mean by that? I think we all understand that Russia will emerge from its war in Ukraine weaker in all ways, economically, geopolitically, and certainly militarily. Uh, and there will therefore be a really significant temptation, I think, especially here in Washington, to downgrade Russia as a threat. But I would argue that that would be a significant mistake because what we see is that Russia is looking to adapt and it is evolving its tactics in response to the challenges that it faces in Ukraine. And just like you talked about, well, what is China preparing for? Well, what is Russia preparing for? And I think we have to be clear that even though the United States isn't fighting Russia in Ukraine, Russia very much perceives or understands itself to be at war with us. 
uh, and it has framed this as an existential challenge and even as a civilizational challenge. And so uh, it will very much retain the intent uh, to challenge the United States for the foreseeable future and certainly past even Putin's time in office. So then what are they preparing to, you know, to do as a part of that civilizational challenge? Well, first and foremost, most immediately, they're looking to evolve. Uh, and they're looking to bypass and circumvent the unprecedented Western pressure that we've put on. Uh, they are looking and actively uh, circumventing sanctions and export controls that the United States and its allies have applied. There was a really great story just today in the New York Times that talked about how Russia is circumventing sanctions and export controls and that they've actually um, expanded its missile production to pre-war level, to pre-war levels. Uh, so this threat is not going away. Uh, they're also actively deepening partnerships with external partners. Obviously in the news today is North Korea and that meeting, that deepening of that bilateral relationship, but it's also Iran and China. So Russia is actively looking to build a coalition of countries that share its hostility to the United States and our influence and our power. And I think that the thing that I worry most about is the more desperate Russia becomes in the war, the more they're going to be willing to give away in, in those relationships. Um, so giving away technology to the North Koreans, to the Iranians. And so they are actually amplifying, making worse America's challenges in other parts of the globe. Um, in addition to the kind of circumventing uh, and mitigating Western pressure, they're also adapting tactics. And I think that's happening on the battlefield in Ukraine, but also in a very broad sense, we can see that the more degraded the Russian military is in terms of its, the conventional military, the more they're relying on its non-conventional tools and tactics. So at the low end in the hybrid realm, that means they're relying more heavily on things like cyber, uh, we'll, we should expect more attacks on things like critical infrastructure, it's sabotage, it's information operations. That will become much more important in Russia's arsenal the more degraded they are conventionally. But then it's also a risk at the high end in the nuclear domain. So we should expect that the nuclear weapons become a much more important part of Russia's uh, military strategy. It's going to be a low cost and very effective way to offset the vulnerabilities that it faces. And so what does that mean? Well, we should expect force posture changes and changes to the structure of its nuclear forces, uh, much more elaborate uh, uh, warning exercises. Uh, and I think, you know, if thinking about the arms control realm, they're actively undermining the, you know, with, with, with uh, suspending its participation in new starts. So this is also the way that they're preparing is they're intentionally introducing risk into the relationship they understand the United States and Europe to be more risk averse than Russia, and so they're introducing that risk as a way to get us to self-restrain. Um, so I think, and, and, and it'll be interesting to think about what, you know, the proliferation of semi-state organizations. All of these types of things I think Russia is working on to try to immediately uh, address vulnerabilities that it sees. And then in the longer term, we should all expect that Russia will certainly look to reconstitute its military and that includes in areas like AI, uh, where they're actively trying to integrate AI into the battlefield in Ukraine. So I think my kind of bumper sticker is that Russia is, is down, but it's not out, and it will remain a good enough power with both the capabilities and the intent to challenge the United States for the foreseeable future. All right, I'm gonna ask a question probably everybody in the audience wants to know about how long uh, this war will go on, but I, I, I'll, I'll set it up a little bit. So I'll ask it, that, you know, former intel officer will never give you a straight answer, though on, on November 11th, I think it was November 11th, 2001, I asked my intelligence analyst, how long is it, you know, will it take Kabul to fall to the Taliban? And he said, oh, it's gonna probably take years. They lasted a long time against the Soviets and, or the Russian, yeah, Soviets at the time. And, and then the next day they, they fell and I said, well, that was, you're worthless to me as an intel analyst. <laughs> So I'm going to ask you the question is, right, if we assume Ukraine has, a, has the will, right, they've demonstrated that in 2014, 2015, and throughout this war, right, that, that's not going to waver. As long as they get supplied, right, get the capabilities that are necessary to fight a war, and if those go away, they'll probably just go to a counterinsurgency. How long can Russia maintain the will, or probably more will than capability, to, to, for the war to go on if it's, you know, from that perspective, is one potential ending? recognizing, right, the war in Afghanistan lasted a decade, and, uh, but their interest in Ukraine are, right, exponentially more than anything else that they've been involved in. So how long can Russia 
I mean, I think Putin, I think it's in, he sees it as in his interest to fight a long war. Um, and so, I mean, you know, first and foremost, he obviously believes that he can outlast the United States and Europe, and he'll look at political changes potentially here in Washington, but also other European capitals, and expect that they could bring changes in leadership and a resulting um, reduction in Western military support for Ukraine. But even more than that, I think, you know, it's in, you, I've done a lot of work on looking at kind of the duration of wars and tied to leaders' interests. And um, Putin, he faces more challenges at home as a result of the war in Ukraine. So the Prigozhin incident is a, certainly a very poignant reminder of that. But I actually think it's in his interest because being at war makes him more secure at home. There's very few authoritarian leaders who are unseated while a war that they are involved in is ongoing. And so for me, I think it helps insulate him in power. As soon as the war ends, there's going to be a political reckoning. There's going to be a lot of questions asked. And certainly, if Russians perceive it as a military defeat, then the risk of him losing his job, which he would equate with probably his life, because we know that these personalist dictators, once they're ousted from office, are jailed, killed, and prison. So it's, he's talking about his own personal survival. And so I see, I believe that it, he perceives it in his interest to keep this going because it actually makes him more secure in office. And so he would like to see that this. And I, and I do think that they have the kind of capacity at home in order to sustain the fighting for quite a long time. Ask you one more question before transitioning to terrorism. So, I mean, why do we? Why, how do we get their performance? How do we predict it so wrong? Is it? I mean, I knew Ukraine's capability, so I they performed how I thought they would. Uh, but even I was surprised by Russia's underperformance. I mean, obviously, you know, somewhat like a meteorologist, we're incentivized to overestimate because the yeah. cost of underestimating can be severe. Um, but what explains kind of this? And it's repeated, but you know, this inability to kind of really anticipate their capability. Is it an intelligence failure? Is it a military industrial complex trying to justify an $800 billion budget? Is it something else? I mean, why do we consistently get this so wrong? Well, I come back to your Afghanistan, and part of me wonders quite a lot. I obviously wasn't in the intelligence community at the time, but they were obviously wrong on their Afghanistan call, thinking that Kabul could last a long time. And I sometimes wonder if they had then the knee-jerk reaction to try to warn um, about in, in the opposite direction. So I think that there was some linkage there. But I, I think generally speaking, we have um, institutionally a predisposition to overestimating Russia's capabilities. And during my time in the intelligence community, I feel like I saw this time and time again in Syria and other places where there's this expectation of what Russia wants, Russia gets without really having spent the time and in investing and in understanding the capabilities and the intent on the receiving end. And so uh, for that reason, I think you know, that was a large part of it. Um, a large part of it is just the way that the war played out, right? That this isn't the, with the training exercises and other things, um, this is not the war that Russia was planning to fight. Um, its plans, because of the personalization of the political system, were also close held. A lot of um, uh, military officers who should have been involved in planning were not. They were excluded from that. And so it was also a poorly planned. So part, it's hard to know if we grossly over, how, that, to what extent we grossly overestimated the Russian army and to what extent some of it was a bit contingent on the plan that was in place which of course was a, a result of the personalization and the rot within, within the Russian system. Thanks, Andrea. All right, Dr. Bacon, we'll, we'll turn now to a discussion of terrorist groups. I mean, over the past decades, right, we've seen consistently evolutions in terms of tactics, organizations, ideology, goals, capability, pretty much everything across the spectrum. So how are terrorist groups evolving and what might we expect to see in the future? Sure, it's probably fitting that I'm last in this discussion because if you open last it, but not least, <laughs> perhaps also least. But um, <laughs> when you go through the national security strategy, you just keep flipping and flipping and flipping before you get to counterterrorism, and there's clearly good reasons for it that we already heard about. So I, I don't necessarily disagree with the downgrading of terrorism, but it does come um, with its own problems because just because we're done with counterterrorism does not mean they are done with us, essentially. And I would say there's two things that have really characterized the jihadist movement over the last you know, 20, probably, probably more accurately, 30 or so years, and that probably will going forward. And the first is their resilience. These are organizations that, despite the massive amount of counterterrorism pressure over the last 20 years, we have really struggled to actually defeat. 
There have been plenty of declarations of defeat. The Taliban in 2001, the Islamic State in Iraq in 2010, al-Shabaab in 2013, the Pakistani Taliban in 2014. And all of these organizations have been able to rebuild and resurge to be stronger than they were before. So I would expect that they will continue to be resilient. And I say that also as a caution because there was a lot of talk at this uh, most recent September 11th anniversary, which in my professional career was the one with sort of the least discussion or fanfare or events or uh, debates of, of any uh, since 2001. And there's a lot of discussion about Al-Qaeda being as its nadir and the Islamic State as being so. And what I would say is these organizations have consistently been declared as defeated, as dead, and they almost never have been. These are just incredibly resilient organizations. And I think the second thing that they're effective at, which it gets to the resilience, is they're very effective at exploiting fertile conditions. And so what we see today is not necessarily a jihadist movement that's weaker, it's one that has morphed. It has an epicenter, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa now, where a place where the United States has, has consistently struggled to recognize the national security importance of that region. And what we see there is jihadist expansion on ways that were unimaginable 20 years ago. The number of organizations, you have uh, both Islamic State and Al-Qaeda affiliates, the number of countries affected, the number of attacks, the number of fatalities, all of the indicators are very, very alarming in sub-Saharan Africa. And there's really no systems in place at this point to do anything to mitigate that downward slide. If anything, the great power, near peer, strategic competition, whatever we're calling it, is exacerbating it. As we see Russia come into the Sahel, for example, and um, essentially make conditions worse and creating conditions that the jihadist groups are even more effective at exploiting. We even see in Afghanistan where, okay, we haven't seen a resurgence of Al-Qaeda yet, but we have seen the Taliban provide per, uh, permissive conditions for the Pakistani Taliban and a significant deterioration in Pakistan. So overall, these are groups that are going to exploit the space that they get from the lack of counterterrorism pressure. They're going to seek uh, ways to disrupt, and that's essentially what they are at this point. They're a disruptive threat to the United States. They have the ability to distract from the very important challenges we face from peers or near peers or however we'd like to characterize them, they're still very capable of those kinds of actions, even if they are not the primary threat anymore. And they're still very effective at exploiting conditions when they are available to expand in terms of their recruitment, their attacks, their safe havens, and even their ability to potentially take over entire states in some places in sub-Saharan Africa. So we're not necessarily in a less dangerous environment. I don't see another September 11th attack coming, but we do have a, a movement overall that has grown and expanded in really important ways and is still exploiting the conditions that exist today. Trisha, I've done a terrible job of managing the time, uh, so I'll ask you one question and then turn it over to the right. audience. For probably maybe Last one or me. two questions. So, uh, what can we do better from a policy perspective in terms of counterterrorism policy? Yeah, no, that's a very reasonable question to ask at this point. And what I would say is, much of the whatever you want to call the years after September 11th, global war on terrorism, etc., we were incredibly good tactically. We're very good at tactical successes in terms of. Um, leadership decapitation or offensives that weaken these organizations, but these different tactics never really came together as effective strategies to execute the, cold, the full defeat of some of these organizations, some of whom really could have been defeated. Um, so I think that that's one of the things that going forward, we're going to have less of those tactics, less of those resources, and it's going to force us to come up with a more uh, comprehensive strategy that isn't so military-centric. Thank you, Trisha. I, I, we probably have time for one or two questions, depending on uh, the length of our answers. Yep. Thank you. Um, hi, I just wanted to, I hope everybody can hear you okay. Um, I, a, a, first of all, thank you very much for your comments. Uh, all very insightful and interesting. And actually, I, I see the kind of arc between all three of you has been uh, useful and incisive. Uh, the question is Kim Jong-un, thank you very much. Uh, we saw Kim Jong-un, um, you know, have a visit with uh, Vladimir Putin, first time in several years. Uh, clearly a, a kind of role change almost, uh, where we have Putin as the supplicant and uh, Kim Jong-un as the, as the superior in a very strange twist. Uh, but has implications for uh, the PLA and for China as well. I wonder if you just comment a little bit about what you think about that role change 
um, how it might evolve over the future, and where China sits in this relationship with Russia right now? That's a great question. I think part of the relationship is just by nature of they both feel constrained by the United States, that US policies are directed at, um, <clears throat> from a Chinese perspective, and I, I, I won't offer the Russian perspective, but from the Chinese perspective, uh, there's a feeling that the US is in decline and that the US is attempting to thwart China's rightful reemergence as a global power. <clears throat> and so Russia, in some ways, is a partner of convenience. I think part of that from the Chinese perspective is also, even though there's a lot of areas where China and Russia are not aligned, uh, there is a personal relationship between Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin that is important that could be taking them a little further than if the mechanisms of the, the two states were left to determine that way ahead. What will happen after one or both of them eventually go away remains to be seen, um, but it certainly is a, a factor. Uh, and then at the end of the day is, um, you know, with China's growth and modernization and that shift of who's the big brother, who's the little brother in the relationship, uh, if China's economy does slow down um, where <clears throat> they're not modernizing at a rapid pace where they the the reliance or the the appetite for some of the strategic resources that russia is able to provide such as minerals and oil where that appetite decreases how will that affect that relationship i don't know the answer but it'll be you know professionally looking at it it will be fascinating to see how that plays out yeah, the only thing i would add is i mean i just see it, there's like a dangerous synergy and i think that when they're even though they have disagreements and their interests diverge Working together, it amplifies the, the net effect of all of them. So they, and they, they understand that, so that they're less isolated when they're cooperating. They're able to distract attention, so that's very useful from China's perspective. I'm sure uh, Putin didn't, doesn't mind if uh, North Korea acts a bit more belligerently on the international stage because that's a distraction. So I think of it as like an, a, syn a synergy and that together they're, they're more threatening than they would be individually. If it was anybody else, I'd say we're out of time, but I believe Peter, <laughs> Peter's got a question. One question for Call me. Calling in a question. Um, it's so uh, for Dr. Bacon, you know, you, you alluded to this. So on September 11th, the National Counterterrorism Center said essentially we, we've won against Al Qaeda. And, and in June, the UN released a report that basically said completely the opposite, you know, the Haqqani, who's the Minister of the Interior, is part of the Leadership Council of Al Qaeda. They have a very different narrative. So I just, uh, I wonder how you adjudicate these seemingly two very different conclusions. And for General Davis, you know, uh, the Chinese face a demographic cliff that they're about to fall off. Their economy, you mentioned, I mean, their real estate is going to crash. Uh, they have a terrible command economy, which is the, the zero COVID policy obviously had a, a lot of impact. Uh, if you look at Pew polling, they're very unpopular. Uh, Belt and Road hasn't gone quite the way they wanted. And, um, and you know, they have a sea of problems. Does that make them more inclined to invade Taiwan in 2027, as she has told TLA to be prepared for, or less? Um, on the question of adjudicating the different assessments of Al-Qaeda, they are very hard, it's very hard to reconcile those two reports, um, to be sure. I think one of the things that we're going to face, though, is an environment of decreasing amounts and quality of information. And it means that people will weigh certain pieces of information more heavily than others. And I think that and there will be sort of baseline assumptions about the organization that will take people in increasingly sort of um, divergent assessments. And um, so I think, I also think that there, there is a, a narrowing of how the U.S. views the threat. It's much more about, is this a threat to the homeland? Is this a threat to the U.S. interest? And the U.N. has sort of a broader aperture and that that explains part of it. But I, oft, I think a lot of it is just the sort of dearth of really quality information to use as a basis for an assessment. And then on your China question, I think that China's economic policy is, in the past has been focused on modernizing before your demographics cliff catches up with you. And with the slowdown, that does complicate uh, the party's domestic agenda. Um, I would say, just from watching them for 25 years now, never underestimate the ability of the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese state to muddle through a problem 
you know, when we think they can't. Uh, and so you know, stay tuned to see what happens. Uh, but it's clear the economy is slowing down. There are a lot of problems. Uh, and this predates the party, but you know, it, it has happened in the past where China's being able to use foreign, foreign actors or foreign problems to refocus domestic frustration. And that could play out in a Taiwan scenario. I think it comes down to, you know, to Xi Jinping. Uh, in the past, the pre previous leaders of the party were content to make progress in unification with Taiwan. Um, Xi's given himself more time with the removal of term limits for, for president. Now, the ter there was no term limit for general secretary of the party or chairman of the Central Military Commission, the other two positions he holds. Um, but does he feel it has to happen on his watch? And I, given his age, at what point does that perhaps become a tipping point in his mind. I don't know, obviously, and I don't think anybody knows, but that's a factor as well. I always say from the Russia case, don't underestimate a personalist dictator's ability to miscalculate. And well, Peter, you set this up like a good party, right? Always leave everybody wanting more instead of <laughs> realizing they stuck around too long. So uh, thank the panel uh, panelists and participating.